I'm delighted to, to be joined by my colleagues Bill Chambra, Senior Fellow at the Hudson Institute, and Alicia Manning, Senior Program Director for the Bradley Foundation in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Welcome to the program. Honored to be here. Bill and Alicia, it's been a, a long time since we've known each other, working in the vineyards of philanthropy and grassroots leaders. And I want us to talk about, you know, private philanthropy following the same trajectory where they rely more on credentialed professionals who were commissioned and they designed solutions for the poor that were parachuted into these programs into these communities with the expectation that people would change. And when they didn't, rather than examining the nature of the intervention, they said that the people are worse off than they thought, therefore we need more money. And so they call that the tyranny of good intentions. And I'm wondering just what your experience is in that. And I wanted to, to sort of unpack not only what is done but who do we rely upon for solutions to problems if they obviously cannot be found by professionals designing them in our universities or in our think tanks and parachuting them in? We found that answers rest other, other, in other places. What, is, what has been your experience in terms of that, that problem that we have a philanthropy to? Well, Bob, you... you put your finger on the problem, which is this uh, infatuation with expertise and professionalism. I mean, we, and ironically enough, private philanthropy was essential to um, the elevation of expertise to this privileged position that it holds in our thinking about these problems. The, the first big American foundations, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Russell Sage, uh, all uh, dedicated their resources to um, concentrating on expertise, the development of professions, uh, the development of, of social welfare uh, uh, leadership that's steeped in the, in the sciences, the social sciences, and so forth. And that's really continued throughout our approach to poverty, not just government, certainly it's in government, but it's also in private philanthropy. And it's, in, it's among the big foundations where you find to this day that kind of, of reliance on the experts. And other smaller foundations follow that lead. I mean, when, when a new donor comes into the field, you know, they wanna, they wanna ask questions like, well, how can I really make a difference? Um, how am I going to know that I'm making a difference? And the answer is almost always, well, we're going to have to ask the experts. You know, let me ask this big foundation in town how you guys do it, right? And that big foundation will have people on their staff who have degrees in social work and other disciplines. And, and so, you know, this reliance on expertise continues, even though, as you point out, it, you know, long since we've been proven, you know, that, that expertise has proven to be uh, not as effective, right, as other solutions, which we'll, which we'll discuss here. What has been your experience uh, in understanding why and who these healing agents are, these grassroots leaders, uh, that we're, we've been talking about. Well, I, I've learned this from you, so I'm really just parroting back characteristics <laughs> that I've gleaned from spending time with you and, and um, paying attention to what you've said throughout the years. But it, it is this sort of possession of moral authority, and I would say that's at the center of it. Um, and it's also where people make mistakes in philanthropy by focusing too much on management and not enough on leadership. So the characteristics of, of a leader that has that moral authority in the community um, uh, flow from that sense of urgency about solving the problem and providing help. And um, then they, it shows up in these different ways that you've articulated um, that you know, they answer, they're available around the clock. They don't keep office hours. 
uh, that, and uh, I think a really important one that we forget to talk about a lot is the, this idea of reciprocity. You don't give something to a passive recipient of help. You give it to them so that they can embody it and pass it forward or pass it back to other people. Yet some of these grassroots leaders also require training. It's not an undisciplined kind of conscience. See, that's the other mistake that people make. The assumption is that, well, these people you know, are, are poor bookkeepers and whatnot. But that's true. But it's true about entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Venture capitalists look for an honest entrepreneur. And once they found they need two things, they need capital, but they need training and managerial help. And because too much money too soon can suffocate it, too little can starve it to death. So a principle of the marketplace is you know how to insinuate resources in to an entrepreneurial event so that it grows responsibly along a continuum. And that's what we do at the Woodson Center. We're constantly seeking not only money, but assistance from people who know how to grow businesses to work alongside my grassroots groups so they can be educated about how to grow um, their, their, their healing uh, approaches in a way that it grows along a responsible continuum. I remember when the Bradley Foundation early on had asked me to come into Milwaukee because those they, they didn't see that leadership. They were told by consultants that leadership didn't exist in the streets of Milwaukee. And, uh, yeah, yeah, right. No, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, this, this particular grassroots leader, he was, he was clearly the real deal, right? There was no question about it. Immense moral authority in the community. Uh, but when it came time to, to and, and so we were, you know, eager to fund him, basically, right? But when it came time for him to describe his program, uh, it, it fell very far short of the kind of... His pr proposal to his, you. His proposal, right, his written proposal to us, uh, you know, would not have passed muster with, with the board or with any, anyone who was running a philanthropy. It would have been very difficult for them to look at that description and say, okay, I, I get it, I understand. So we turned to the center and asked you all to, uh, you know, one of your staff persons to uh, help this person describe the program in, in writing in such a way that we could then take that uh, to the foundation, to the board, and, and uh, secure funding for it, which we did. The door opens when the Woodson Center comes in and does that kind of, of survey of, of grassroots leadership. That really is where the process begins. You don't judge someone by the inability to express themselves in writing. Because as you say, the groups that have fancy annual reports and you know um, logic model programs um, sometimes are not effective in delivering, but the people who are most effective lack the structure. And what you funded, the Bradley Foundation, is fund the enabling functions. And then you funded it, and um, Alicia, there, we, I think, when, there were just other innovative ways. Some of, can you just identify some of the more other innovative examples? Oh, well, sure, there are all kinds. But one of my favorite ones to return to is one you know well, which is Running Rebel. Um, this is an organization um, founded and still run to this day by Victor Barnett and his wife, Dawn Barnett. And uh, what started as something very small, which, which was Victor driving around with um, basketballs in the trunk of his car and meeting under a tree in the park because they had no office, um, is now um, a sophisticated operation that does have a lot of these sort of meet, meets the professional standards of a functioning, you know, nonprofit organization with an HR department and, you know, a board with committees and all, you know, everything that we all like to see in the foundation world. 
but it never ever lost its its sort of primary sense of um, urgency about solving the problem to, to, to an almost irrational degree. Um, uh, the people who sort of are driven to do these kinds of things are driven by something inside of them. It's not external. They're not doing it for a grant and they're not going, they're going to do it whether we give them money or not. If you were talking to a, of a new funder like this who is seeking guidance, uh, what would be some of the things based upon what we have experienced you would say to them? Well, if, if just a quick uh, a quick comment. I mean, I think you've you've embedded in that question is is the answer, and that is um, people ha people think in certain categories of meeting needs, right? I mean, okay, uh, education is a problem. Well, okay, charter schools is the standard response from a certain kind of funder, right? I mean, that um, uh, you know homelessness. Uh, joblessness, a, l a lot of these things, you know, we have standard answers for. Who runs the best, where is the best program in the country to address this problem, right? And there are all sorts of experts on, you know, this, what what kind of model is working here or there or the other place. So you, you go into the problem-solving uh, uh, situation with a certain well-defined silo Right, you of of programs that you you think you can deliver, and we all do that. I mean, we all have this sort of okay, this is the problem, and this is the range of programs. But if you actually start with the people in the neighborhood who are suffering the problem, who are solving the problem, right? I mean, they have every reason to want to solve the problem. And the people we're talking about with moral authority have been solving the problem for a long time. But it's a matter of giving through grassroots leaders as opposed to giving around them. Right. And so these are, the, these are the very important, subtle, but very profound principles that I think donors have to follow and be aware of. There are just endless examples yeah. of how untutored grassroots leaders can reach young people in ways that professionals cannot. And, and, and so the, the challenge is how can we convince donors of this new way of supporting restoration efforts in these communities? Well, one of the things about, about uh, the concept of civil society, uh, you know, we, we believe in civil society as Americans, especially conservatives. I worked for uh, conservative organizations all my life, and civil society was part of our concern. And what that meant was, uh, in theory anyway, uh, that people... Uh, especially assembled in local communities, have the capacity to solve their own problems. It's the faith that they have the, the democratic capacity to understand and solve their own problems, right? It, that's hard to disagree with as an American. Um, and yet, as we've been discussing, right, everything we do by, through big philanthropy, through government, uh, infantilizes the people that we're trying to help and disempowers the people we're trying to help and defies this notion that people, you know, everyday people really do have the knowledge and the capacity to solve their own problems. Woodson principles is, <laughs> the Woodson approach is basically living out that faith in civil society, that, that faith in um, the American capacity to solve problems through democratic participation. That's all these leaders are. They're, they're folks who have been validated uh, in their neighborhoods uh, through, through the kinds of, through what they do. You know, not just what they say, but what they do.
characteristics of the grassroots leaders that you're describing include not sitting around waiting for someone to give them permission <laughs> to do what's right, right? They're, they're not waiting for, for permission. They just do what they know. And I think it relates to what you were just describing. Um, we are, um, you know, first we, we uh, began to believe that people are not capable of solving their own problems. But after decades and decades of this, um, and of, of sort of the activity in the neighborhood being supplanted um, by other kinds of programs, I think we've sometimes, sometimes I think we've begun to see ourselves as incapable of doing anything different. And, and I think um, conservatives um, have some responsibility to bear for that because we talk a lot about rights and we talk a lot about personal responsibility, but we don't talk about capability. And if you're a donor, um, you have to embody your capability to do something different. You know, a lot of, of funders are very afraid to do anything until they have the perfect plan, right? Okay, I'm going <laughs> to really define exactly what I want to do, and then I'm going to consult the experts and how best to do it, and then... And then I'm going to fret, and I'm going to talk to more people. The, you know, basically, you've got to get going. You've got to get into the neighborhood, and as Alicia says, start with small grants. That's fine. You know, that first five. Well, that's how we started with Victor Barnett, who I'm proud to say I was there at the at the outset of that uh, funding. Um, you know, it was a, a very small grant for a trip to take his kids. Uh, to a tournament, right? They didn't have the bus money to get these kids to a tournament, and we helped them out with that. And then, you know, from that little grant to what they are today is quite a distance. But, uh, you know, we had no guarantee that Victor Barnett was going to be this in the future. He was, he was what he was. He was doing great work. And, you know, it was giving a small grant was what, you know, how we got started. And we did that again and again with a great many grassroots uh, leaders. There's no substitute for for uh, really getting an experience of of what these grassroots leaders are dealing with, and that's why you need to be um, in their in their presence and with them as they work. And you know, without without you know. Uh, swanning in as the great benefactor. Oh, we're you know we're we're evaluating you for a check. You know we might give you a check for fifty thousand dollars, and you know if you meet our standards, if you if you're going to do that, you're going to get a very artificial understanding of what the group is doing. Whereas uh, you know it was, of course, you're you're going in and you know, you may or may not be helpful to this group, but. Uh, the first priority should be figuring out what they're doing through this experience in a way as undistorted as possible by your wealth and by the possibility of grant making. This, this dialogue is just so important because this is just one of a series of discussions that I want us to have as we think through these issues. Uh, I want to be able to come back to you to see where we are when we are making some changes to assess how we're doing, but also what we can do better and differently than we have been doing. So I want to thank Alicia, Bradley Fanta, and Bill from Hudson Institute. Thank you so much for taking this time and sharing with me, the center, and with the public. I hope you've enjoyed with me an exploration of ways that we can help the people that I love and serve all of my life at the Woodson Center.